as light fades and the shadows deepen, all petty and exacting details vanish, everything trivial disappears, and I see things as they are in great strong masses. The buttons are lost, but the sitter remains. The sitter is lost, but the shadow remains. The shadow is lost, but the picture remains. And that night cannot efface from the painter's imagination. Artist James Abbott McNeil Whistler. This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Your art lesson today comes from artist Phil Stark. Phil Stark's goal as a painter is to suggest light. In this episode, he explains how he achieves this goal through simplification. When you view Phil's paintings, you see that they glow with light, atmosphere, and texture. He explains that if you can focus on what is important, you can paint with a stick and it should work. Phil's interest in painting began in his youth in Germany, where his father was stationed while serving in the military. Regular field trips to the great museums of Europe exposed Phil to the great painting masters. Later, upon returning to, to the United States, Phil chose an advertising track at the American Academy of Art in Chicago. However, inspired by his art instructors at the Academy, he developed a passion for oil painting. When he graduated from the American Academy of Art, Phil chose to pursue becoming a professional fine art painter. Phil has lived in a number of locations, including the American Midwest, the West, and Southwest. In each place he has resided, Phil has found beauty that he was compelled to paint. A recent move took him from Arizona, a land of tans and muted gray-greens, to North Georgia, where the rolling hills and mountains are covered with vibrant green trees and vegetation. Barely settled into his new home, he has already begun to explore the beautiful backcountry of Georgia, including its rural farmlands and the multitude of creeks and rivers that flow through the countryside. In this episode, you will hear that there are no secrets. Phil Stark does not hold back in sharing what he has learned about painting. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. Yesterday, I was looking out my back door into a corner of a neighbor's yard, uh, and I was admiring the the backlit light that was coming through the leaves. It's a little section of woods, fall color was coming through, and I was just standing there mesmerized in thought. And my wife came up and said, what are you looking at? And I said, well, I'm, 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 I'm just enjoying this beautiful glow of backlighting coming through the fall leaves there. And you know... Phil, it reminded me of your work. When I look at your work, there's this kiss of raking light or backlight that comes through so beautifully in almost all your paintings. And oh, uh, yeah, so it's it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today on the Artful Painter because I want to I want to explore this. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Yeah. So you're a transplant from Arizona to Georgia now, and right. I was excited to hear that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I've been here about a month, and we were in Arizona for about 20 years. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I have to buy pants now. All I had was shorts and two songs. <laughs> <laughs> and an umbrella. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. That's true. Be be prepared for extremes. That's what we get here in yeah. in Georgia. So, well, it's nice to have you in my backyard, as yeah, it were. Yeah, good, good, good to be here. Yeah. So, Phil, how do you describe your work and the painting that you do. I, I gave my impression, but I'd like to hear what you think of or how do you describe your work to others? Yeah, it's kind of ongoing because it you know changes. But I, uh, what I found more than anything else is I'm constantly trying to simplify. So my reason for painting, it helps me when I simplify that. And so my goal in painting is to suggest light uh, so light's kind of what I focus on because I find it easier to paint when I focus or break things down to what's really important. And uh, light seems to be it. So when I can focus on that, 
Um, that frees me up from being too or getting too complicated, caught up in detail or concerned about technique. I think that's one thing I have learned through the years of painting is technique and, and all that other stuff really is not that important. And if, if you can focus on what's important, you can put paint on with a stick and it should work. Is that what you use sticks now? Yes. Or? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I wish I could because brushes are getting so expensive. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. To, to, to simplify things is, is the key to me. It used to be, I thought the more complicated I got things, the better the painting, but, but not so. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of deconstructing as I get older, I guess. You know, I noticed that in uh, an exhibit I saw back at the booth with uh, Frederick Remington, you know, he was a detailed illustrator, beautiful yeah. work. But later in life, uh, he, he became more abstracted. Uh, it would have been interesting to see how far he would have went had he not died prematurely. Yeah, yeah, he was uh, pretty young, I guess, when he when he passed. Yeah. Well, okay, so that's that's what I'm looking for. Is you know, I'm uh, it's it's a bit of overwhelm when I'm learning. You know, I'm one trying to decide what to paint, how to paint it. And uh, it, it does get complicated really, really quick. <laughs> so yeah. uh, how do you go to, through that process of simplification? Uh, this, this is something that would be interesting to me to, to, to get better at. Well, I, and part of that came through teaching. I do a lot of teaching online and uh, physical workshops. Is that most students get so involved in everything that they see. Like you say, they become overwhelmed. Uh, so breaking thing, things down to more simple terms makes it easier to understand. And, I, you know, when you when you teach, you tend to teach yourself more than anybody else. So I, I learn more from my own workshops, I think, than anybody taking the workshop, because you have to really think through what you're teaching and how you're teaching it. Uh, the biggest problem I see in students is, like you say, overwhelmed and not knowing what to discard. If you can look at a, a, a subject or a, a landscape and know right away what to get rid of, then you're, you know, you're, you're halfway there. Or to know what's important and let the rest of it go. Uh, that's the that's the key because we tend to think, or kind of the default is, if I run into problems, I'll just start adding more detail. That's kind of our default. But all that does is add more detail. It doesn't make it better. So breaking things down to just what's important and simplify it really makes the learning process a lot, a lot better. How would I go about that? What would I decide? How would I learn the lesson of simplification? Where would I start? I think more in, in terms of composition first. And when we start painting, we all love color. So we think about color. Oh, yeah. And how to mix color and, and how to match color, uh, because that's, you know, Oil painting is about color, but how you compose those shapes is really what makes the painting. Because you can have really nice color and great brushwork, but if it's a bad composition, it just it doesn't go anywhere. And uh, I think the opposite is true. I can have kind of funky color or not the greatest color scheme going, but if it's a good composition, it still grabs the eye. It still works on some level. So composition first, arranging things in bigger, simpler masses shapes and then from there to value because the most important thing about color is value how dark or light you make the color because i can make you know a, a tree green orange yellow really doesn't matter about the color but it's the value that is important because that's what suggests the light is the value so those two things composition and value over color if you can kind of get that in your head it makes it easier to proceed or easier to practice i think I think about photography because that's, that's my original background in the creative space. And one of the first photographers I was interested in was Ansel Adams. You know, he created the zone system, which was a value system. Uh -huh. And yeah. it was black and white photography. <laughs> and of course, composition was a huge part of his oh, work. Yeah. 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 Obviously, you know, color wasn't his focus. It's not that color doesn't matter because, you, you know, right. it helps to understand color harmony and how to achieve it and, and how to know the color wheel, which is a good way to simplify learning about color. But uh, when you put color ahead of value, then it tends to fall apart. At least it does for me. 
And that's probably why my paintings can be so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I started off as a Fovis. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Usually if I'm having trouble with a painting or a student is having trouble, 99% of the time it's value related. Right. You know, they'll say, I don't like the color. Well, it's rarely the color that's at fault. It's, it, it's more the values or the composition. When I look at your work, I see there's a, there's a certain joy that seems to come out in the paintings. You seem to celebrate the landscape. Uh, it's, they're peaceful, they're, they're beautiful. And it's what a contrast it is to a lot of the art that we see today. Um, I would describe art, a lot of art that we see is shock art. You know, it appears yeah. to, to relish negativity, you know, political issues, environmental issues, social yeah. issues. And I'm not, I'm not saying those aren't important, but I don't want to be entertained by those things. I don't want, I, I want peace in my life. Right. And, and right. Uh, so it's, it makes me happy to see artwork like yours. And, and it seems to be a resurgence of beautiful art uh, today. I don't know if that's because I'm looking for it or there, it, it truly does seem like there's more and more people doing representational art that's uplifting. Yeah, that seems to be what most people enjoy looking at, whether they're artists or not, or understand art or not. It goes in that direction as opposed to the other direction, which is more political or, you know, have some cause to carry, which, like you say, can be important. But, uh, you know, I, I just paint because I enjoy doing it. And I think we're all we're all created to be creative because I think God was a creative or is is creative and for made in his image. Then we have some of that in us. So, yeah, I just paint because I enjoy it. <laughs> it's not real intellectual, but. <laughs> well, that's good. It doesn't have to be complicated, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. I do, it, I do it because it's fun. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now, there's sometimes it's not so fun and that's because of the learning process. Uh, right. But I don't know. There's, there's this philosophy today of follow your passion. And, but I'm thinking, well, you know, it's great to do what you enjoy, but 90% of getting to where you uh, enjoy something is the work that's involved to, that goes with yeah. it. So, yeah. And I can't do anything else. I never have. So <laughs> I've had part-time jobs, flipping burgers or working construction. But if I quit painting, I would, you know, I'd have to get a, a job that pays an hourly wage. So, so you, if you were a residential painter, you'd be doing murals and eat murals in people's rooms. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to find a way to express yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a good way to learn. Just, you know, get yeah. rid of all other income things. And, uh, then you have to learn. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> What were some of the influences that helped you formulate this idea that I'm not going to, to be anything other than a painter? Well, one thing was my, my uh, dad was in the army, so we traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. We lived in Europe for three years, uh, Germany. And the nice thing about Germany is you could jump on trains real cheap. And we would, as a family, get on a train and uh, go to Rome or uh, Florence I uh, went to Switzerland, just all over, visited some museums. Of course, every church there is a museum. It's full of paintings and sculpture. And so that was kind of overwhelming. It just really hit me pretty hard. How old were you at that time? 10 to 13. Wow. Okay. So, um, and my parents always got me a lot of art books and, you know, just really didn't push it, but it was always, it was always there. I also had a great uncle that was a, a commercial artist in the 20s and 30s in uh, St. Louis. And he lived to be, I think, 95. So I got to know him a little bit before he passed. Nice. But he went to night school in the teens after World War I in St. Louis. And uh, his figure drawing teacher was Oscar Burninghouse, who was a founding, founding Taos artist. And he would come back to St. Louis, I guess, for a season or two and teach uh, figure drawing. My great uncle has all his figure drawings from school. He said Oscar wasn't a very good teacher because he would sit down to show you something and do the whole drawing. So he had these this portfolio full of Oscar Burning House figure drawings. Oh wow! Figure, uh, <laughs> and uh, which he passed on to me. So those are those are real nice. Oh, I would love to see that. But he, you know, he stayed in St. Louis and was a commercial artist, and then 
during the depression was kind of called back to the farm and he never really made a living at, at art after that, but he always did watercolors and gouache on the farm. But um, he would talk about the Taos painters when I was in high school and all the artists he continued to correspond with from St. Louis. So that was a big inspiration to me too. I knew early on that I, that's what I wanted to do. I had no idea how to do it or, you know, how an artist makes a living, but um, uh, that's what I wanted to do early on. How did you figure that out? Well, I decided to go to art school after high school. And um, where was that? Uh, I went to Chicago Art Institute. Okay. I uh, got married fairly soon, right after high school, and we trucked up to Chicago, which was a big culture shock. But the Art Institute was, this was early 70s, so, or mid, mid 70s. Mid, mid to late 70s. And it was, wasn't was a great place to learn representational painting. So it's a great place to get tattoos or other stuff that had nothing to do with art. And then my wife, who got a job at a bank, worked in the advertising department. And several artists that worked in the department had gone to the American Academy of Art, which was across the street from the Art Institute. So that's where, where I ended up going. And I was there for about three and a half years. Was there any particular instructor that was instrumental in the development of your career? Yeah, there's a, a figure drawing teacher there, Bill Parks. That I think a lot of people have talked about and he had been there for a long time and uh, life drawing or figure drawing and um, probably more so him than uh, anyone else there. He was just very, he talked a lot, inspirational, was always interested in what you're doing, but it was a very direct Teach. In other words, you had a year of fundamentals, a year of life drawing. Then you decided whether you wanted to go into commercial art or illustration or fine art. And then it was uh, figure drawing in the morning and figure painting in the afternoon. And on the weekends, you did landscape painting. Which one of those tracks did you take? I took the fine art. Yeah. Tried a little bit of the commercial because I had no idea how to make a living as a fine artist, uh, fine artist, but I didn't do very well at that. It was a good, it was a good school. They didn't teach you how to be an artist, which is what the Art Institute did. You know, everyone sat around and talked about how to be artsy, but uh, <laughs> the, the academy gave you tools to use and then you can spend the rest of your life trying to figure out what it is to be an artist. So, so they were good with the fundamentals, the skills, <laughs> developing the skill of being a, exactly, a fine yeah. art painter. What about yeah. the business side of things? They weren't too good at that. <laughs> 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 that's, that's what my wife and I sit around and talk about is, you know, why don't they teach artists how to, uh, you know, the business side of of art. But, you know, I can understand you know, that's a totally different concept. And, and that's something, too, you just have to figure out. And uh, we struggle to do that for a long time. So plus everything is, is based upon the economy. You can know the business side of, of painting really well. And if the economy flattens out, painting sales are always the first to go. So I think we look for a formula and, and think that if you follow that recipe, no matter what time period or when or how or who you are, it's right. going to work. And, and there really isn't any such thing. Right. And it's awful tempting to find something that works, a subject matter that's going to sell. And, and that might work for a short period of time, but in the long run, it doesn't help you at all. As you learned to paint, Phil, was there anything that gave you that uh, aha moment, that bit of comprehension that took your art to the next level in quality? Oh, yeah, yeah there's, there's always a few things that happen along the way that kind of bump you up a little bit. One, I think, is when I would think outside the box. In other words, you get kind of trapped in the idea of, 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 of especially if you're trying to make a living at just selling paintings, trying to figure out what sells. And you get trapped in an idea of, of, you know, if I paint this subject and sell it in this area, it's going to sell well. And that kind of hems you in a little bit of, as, as far as your thinking goes. And then your starts to reflect in your painting. But when I started to think outside the box and not worry about selling, and one point I realized I just, I had to travel more visit museums more, see shows uh, of, of good work. And um, for me also experiencing different subject matters. So 
we were in Missouri after art school and we stayed there. And I really loved painting Missouri countryside farms and also Kansas. But just getting away from that and going to Montana or Wyoming was really helpful just to see, you know, I'm still painting light, I'm still trying to compose, but just different subject matter. And also once in a while doing still life figure painting really helps the landscape. Mainly because figure painting is so hard, it makes landscape seem so much easier. This is, the, this is the biggie for me. But going to museums and really studying other artists and see how they see things helped. And a couple of workshops I took. You know, you glean a few things from a workshop that kind of open your eyes on uh, some things. So, do, do you remember who who those workshops were with? Yeah, and they're fairly simple too. I took a workshop from Skip Whitcomb. Oh, wow. Yeah. 10 years ago. And just a few real simple things that he focused on that I knew, but just kind of let slip in my work because we get caught up in trying to make the artwork sellable, which just kind of, you know, it destroys it more than helps it. But he really focused on shadow pattern and had us do these. We we were out in the desert and we were doing these little black and white paintings and not even value paintings, just either all black or all white. Kind of like a no tan type thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. With paint. And I was just, oh, my goodness, I'm out here to learn how to paint with color. What am I doing with? But after the workshop and, and thinking through that and, and, and just focusing on that shadow pattern to set up the composition, it helps you simplify what you're looking at and uh, find the strong contrast in the painting right away. And helps you eliminate what's not important. So just simple things like that, which I already knew, but I figured I had moved on from it and was into more sophisticated stuff than painting. But getting back to the more simple, basic stuff is really what helped my painting more than anything. And seeing a few shows. I remember the Soroya show back in the 80s that made the rounds. I think I saw it in St. Louis. I don't know how many, 80 to 100 Soroya paintings was a big, uh, big help to me. And Sargent show, was it Detroit or New York? But anyway, uh, just hitting a few major shows is, is, is always really helpful. I, I, um, I'm, I'm still so. <laughs> fascinated by your story about Skip uh, Whitcomb. And, and you're, uh, I, I was... I was amused by your attitude about that. I'm, I'm glad you were very candid about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I didn't say that to him. I was thinking I, that. I, to I know. <laughs> uh, Dan Young uh, tells a, a similar story, but a, a, a different, uh, it's of a different nature. I have to go back and, and listen to that episode uh, with Dan Young. But, uh, but I, it reminded me of the story of, Vince Lombardi, he was the winningest football ball coach. And they said each time he went in front of his professional players before a game, he would hold up the football and say, gentlemen, this is a football. (laughs) So you talk about going back to basics, but he said it focused them on that because you get you get hung up on all these little details. And uh, sometimes it's the basics that get you firmly rooted in winning the game. And yeah. our game is to to win at creating a beautiful work of art. That's true. Yeah. One thing that helped me with color, which we all struggle with because color is the most, you know, it's like nailing jello to the wall. It's uh, everybody <laughs> sees it differently and uh, approaches it differently. But again, getting it down to more basic, simple terms of just thinking about the color wheel. So that every color I look at, whether I'm in the studio or outside, um, I don't try and match what I see. I look at it and decide what color is that on the color wheel and then just modify it from there. And that's, you know, it's a real simple thing. It's not real profound, but man, it sure eliminates a lot of uh, complicated mistakes that just mess up the painting. So can you give me an example of what you're talking? Because when I when I think of the color wheel, I'm thinking of. You know, the, the standard color wheel, I think it has like 12 colors around it. You've got your primaries, your secondaries, and your tertiary colors on there. So you say, and you're picking one of those primaries and, and two secondaries, or how is that working? Yeah. I, you know, in nature, we see more tertiary colors or I guess secondary colors, like yellow, green, blue, green. We don't really see things in terms of green, green. 
uh, maybe on a cloudy day where there's not the effect of strong sunlight, you see a green or green. But most of the time, those tertiary colors or more natural colors. The only time I might see a real strong red is maybe a red painted barn on a cloudy day. That's red. But when the sun hits that barn, it turns to red orange or maybe yellow orange or orange because of the effect of sunlight. And the shadow side of the barn turns to more of a red violet because the, of the temperature change, the coolness of shadows, you know, reflection of the sky in the shadows. So thinking in terms of the color wheel like that, making a decision on a clean color, then, you know, getting the value right and uh, the temperature. It is just a way of simplifying it and not getting it complicated or get me away from trying to copy what I see exactly, which that's what a camera does. So I kind of freed, my, freed myself up from just being a camera and trying to reproduce what's there. I'd rather have my painting look like paint. And what helps me with color, again, is to simplify the color to, you know, one of those 12 colors, thinking about value and then temperature. And then, you know, I can always modify it, make it stronger or more muted with complement. But yeah, when I simplify everything, I, I tend to have a better painting at the end. So you could take a, a relatively dull scene and, and by being selective in your color scheme, uh, create something that has a lot of impact. Oh, yeah. 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 And a good exercise is to... In the, in the studio for using photography to use black and white photographs and come up with your own color scheme. That way you're focusing on composition and value and you're coming up with what works color wise. You know, it doesn't matter if it's red, blue or yellow, but what matters is the value of the color and the temperature and how intense it is or how muted it is. So, yeah. It's amazing how, how similar painters and filmmakers are you know my background's in filmmaking so <laughs> i've talked to a, a number of filmmakers who were very um, particular about their color choices and how it affected their movies um, oh yeah yeah it's, it's why you have that blockbuster look where the teal and and uh, orange is is really emphasized because it's emphasizing the flesh tones and it, yet it gives it this this uh, modern look or uh, some other scheme that may that may work for that particular movie. It conveys an emotion throughout right. that that uh, that film. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good exercise in painting too. Doing just small studies of, of uh, one subject with uh, different color schemes. You know, a split complementary color scheme and or, or a triadic color scheme, and but have one image and do it three or four different times, and and uh, you really get different moods in each, each one, each different one because of the color changes. Plus it produces harmony when you, you use a color scheme. I don't use color schemes when I'm outside. I just use my full palette, but in the studio, I like to do studies like that to pick out a good, a good color scheme. Well, it's nice to have choices like that, right? Yeah. Uh, you've mentioned painting outdoors and so it, it, it factors in heavily in your work, it seems. Uh, what, what is the value of painting outdoors? What are the benefits? Well, that's where you learn to paint, actually. Landscape is, is outside. In uh, art school, photography was a real no-no unless you were in illustration or commercial work. But you learned to see color and compose outside because the camera already does that for you. It composes usually poorly unless you're trying to come up with a good composition. Uh, so outside is really where you learn to compose, simplify your values and how you read color. After art school... About three or four years later, I realized the importance of photography because, you know, you just can't paint everything you see all the time. So it took a while to learn how to use photography because it was back then, of course, it was a little four by six inch prints. It wasn't a huge computer monitor like we use now. But yeah, uh, those prints didn't have the dynamic range that we have oh, today no. with digital photography. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I always combined a color sketch outside with the photography yeah, but for me, outside was where I learned to paint. When I moved to Arizona, my goal was to paint outside 80, 90 percent of the time and and do studio work not very often because I wanted to be outside more. Ended up not turning out that way. What I do now, mostly outdoor for me, is to 
kind of refresh my color sense when I go on painting trips. I'll do a lot of small ones to get a feel for the color of the area. But I enjoy now the uh, process of, of working in the studio using the uh, color sketches I do outside and the photography and coming up with compositions and then color scheme from there in smaller value and color studies and then go into the bigger painting. I kind of like that process. I enjoy that. Uh, so, so it changes. I used to do larger ones outside and then touch them up inside a little bit, but that's kind of reverse now. So smaller ones outside and bigger studio work inside. Nice. You mentioned earlier that uh, you go out with a full palette. What are the colors on your palette when you go outdoors? That's changed some too. In art school, we had, um, I think, 11 colors, maybe 12 plus white, but it was, you know, three primaries, cad yellow light, cad red light, and ultramarine blue. And then almost a, a, a color for every color on the color wheel. Alizarin crimson would be a red violet, uh, cadmium orange, uh, yellow ochre, which is a earth color, burnt sienna, iridium green. I don't remember if we had a violet or not. And for a while, ivory black. But then getting out of art school about five or six years later, I was struggling with color. So I went to just a primary palette. I'd seen a few artists using that and had been to a museum where uh, artists that were working outdoors were using a very limited palette earth palette of, of, of red, yellow, and blue, you know, like a burnt sienna, ochre, and ultramarine blue. So I decided to try that. I used cad red light, cad yellow light, and ultramarine blue and white. And I used that for about, gosh, 10 years. 10 years? Yeah, and wow. I really, you really learn how to mix color when you yeah. just have those, those three. And once in a while, I'd throw in alizarin crimson, and once in a while, a green, maybe a viridian, but not, not, not very often. But one thing... You always get color harmony when you when you just have three yeah, colors. Right. But I, I actually realized you get better color when you mix those colors with the same three. And I can create a lot of intensity with those three uh, by blocking in a painting with everything at least slightly muted and then picking those one or two areas where I want to use a bit more pure color or just two mixtures instead of three. So... Again, the idea of simplifying your color makes it so much easier. Now I have probably a, a warm and cool of each primary. Cad yellow light, yellow ochre for the two yellows. Cad red, medium, and alizarin crimson for the two reds, warm and cool. Uh, ultramarine blue and cerulean for a warm and cool blue. Then I throw in a viridian and a, a violet, maybe deoxazine purple. And I have burnt sienna too. So the main colors I, I use are still the three primaries and I'll block a painting in mostly with those and everything else are kind of accent colors or modifying colors to adjust things. So I tend to see things better if I can really simplify down to basics and try not to get too complicated because I think we try and complicate painting way too much. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that it's not that it should it's not that it's easy no it it's be, not but it should be simple so but that's the trick how do you get there you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know so I've, I've been to just a few workshops i i stopped this year I, i'm on hiatus workshop hiatus well i did i, I have seen a demo or two this year. Um, actually, I've seen three. I'm a hypocrite. I admit it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I almost, I almost prefer a demo over a workshop simply because I want to watch the artist work and then I can go home and experiment with the things that right. I saw. I don't want to copy that artist, um, but I do want to try a few of their you know, uh, things that I observed. Right. Sometimes I don't even know what the question is, but if I'm watching them say, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even think about doing that. That's a good idea. So I like watching artists and then going home and in the, in the privacy of my, my studio experimenting with that. Uh, Cause it takes the pressure off of me. I, I enjoy that. I forgot yeah. where I was going with that. <laughs> what was I? <laughs> You're, I can't you're, even remember where I was going there. You're you're on a vacation from from workshops. I'm trying. Yeah. Uh, 
they're fun. Oh, I know where I was going with this, though. Each workshop, the artist has a different set of colors. Yeah. And, and so they give you the materials list and nothing wrong with that. It's great. But after a while, I've accumulated all these colors and, I, you know, I get confused. Like, well, okay, wait a minute. Am I using Matt Smith's palette? Am I using Scott Christensen's palette? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, somebody <laughs> else. And after a while, it, they all get jumbled up and I got all these tubes of colors and I have to make a conscious decision to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible and work with what I know so far. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and all those palettes are, are geared towards the color wheel. And yeah. it's just a matter they're of good co- yeah, they're of, good of a personality. So what I what I think or what I get the most out of is seeing somebody when I watch somebody paint is to understand their thought process. Yeah, uh, no matter what their palette is. And I I did have one workshop uh, I took where we had to buy twenty one colors. Twenty one. And I won't I won't say who the artist is really good. And when he demoed, he just used the three primaries, red, yellow, blue. He never used any other. <laughs> but if I can understand their thought process of simplifying values or their thought process and or their thought process of how they think in terms of color, then watching their demo makes more sense. But if it's a demonstration where they're not explaining what their thinking is, it's hard to glean much from it. So uh, understand the thinking behind it, I think is really, really important. Well, when I look at your, your paintings, as I mentioned at the beginning, they're filled with light and there's also atmosphere. How do you accomplish that, that atmosphere and that look of light in these paintings? Um, Values. (laughs) Values. Okay. (laughs) Well, and that's the gentlemen. Again. This is a football. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, when you create atmosphere, it's it's really all a matter of values and color temperature, and it's hard to stress how important it is to eliminate detail. That a, a block in of a painting, if you're trying to suggest atmosphere, the block in has to be so simple. Because the minute you start to introduce detail too soon, you're going to lose your atmosphere. So, you know, I have students do just block ins. So you give them a time limit on a small painting, uh, 30 minutes to get a block in done. And they don't have time for detail, but they can look at the block in and they can see how to adjust things to create more depth or create more sense of light, how to adjust the values. But if you've cluttered your painting up a detail, or things that don't matter, it's, it's, it's impossible to, to create those things. So to create that sense of sunlight or, or a sense of atmosphere, if I can simplify, then I'm going to get that a lot, a lot better than with, again, too much stuff involved. So... With that simplification, I'm looking at your paintings and there is a impression of detail, right? Uh, which is beautiful. So, yeah. so it's simplified, but yet there's an impression of detail. How do you accomplish that impression of detail? Then that's the next step. But I think students try and jump to that. Oh yeah. We want to get right into that. Version. Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, when we did landscapes in art school, all I did was eight by tens, six by eights, once in a while, 11 by 14. And they were all block. I just did block ends for the first two or three years. I never tried to finish a painting. And I think one of the goals was do 100 six by eights first, where you're just focusing on simple block in. At the end of the hundred, you know, they won't look very good, but you'll have an idea in mind of what you're what you're trying to do to to create that block right. in that works. Then from there, deciding, you know, wherever the focal point is, that's going to be the most detail. And then detail is just a matter of taking those two simple values of light and dark and deciding how much 
how much you're going to break it up into smaller shapes of dark and light. But most of it isn't value change when you go to detail. I think what creates a more subtle finish is just broken color. So my finished painting, if I turn it into a black and white on the computer, the value should still be really simple. But it's the color differences that create that finished look. Because too many values would just kill a painting. So I might have a tree that has two simple values in the block in. And when I finish that tree to suggest some detail, I might add another value in the shadow. So I have two values in the shadow and another value in the light. So I have a light and a half tone in the light area and a light and shadow and a dark and a dark accent in the shadow. But just those four values. Then the rest of it's broken color. Same value, different color. So the lights, I can have three or four different colors, but they're going to be pretty much the same value or same two values in the lights. Same thing with the shadow. I can have three or four values or colors in the shadow, but only one or two value changes. And so when you're saying broken color, you're, you're, you're saying it's not, you're, instead of one solid color mass, that you might have variations of a similar color? Yeah. Yeah, a subtle color change. So right. if I have a blue-green shadow color in a tree, I might also scrub in while it's wet. Same value, maybe a blue-violet or a even a, a dark yellow-green in there. It's a subtle color change, but same value. Because those value changes are what create detail. And you get too many little value changes, it just kills the sense of, of light and atmosphere. Well, you've moved to Georgia, so you got a big field of green to paint. Yeah, now. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to tackle that? <laughs> uh, just, just blue and yellow. <laughs> just that <laughs> limited palette. <laughs> yeah, yeah, limited. I, but in all well, seriousness, how do you? How does? How do you take something that's almost? Uh, monochromatic, as it were. I know it's not really monochromatic. I mean, we see with an artist's eye, we do see the variation, right. but it's not as pronounced as the the American West, where you have yeah. stark contrast, you have vegetation that stands alone. You might have a big cottonwood tree or sycamore tree out there, and the the pinkish red willows all by themselves, or a saguaro cactus, or what you know. Those things they're isolated. Here, it is a mass of trees. Yeah. It is. How do yeah, you create tree. interest out of that? Trees are everywhere. Um, <clears throat> uh, an artist friend of mine wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell him. <laughs> well, I, I think the, the mistake is, you know, you, you come here from Arizona and Arizona doesn't have any green green. Everything is a olive green or muted green but here there's all kinds of bright greens and i think the mistake would be to run out and buy i can't even think of the tubed greens now the terra vert or uh permanent green light olive nothing green, wrong with having those. green yeah yeah all those greens but if you start with just the ultramarine blue and cad yellow light and sit down and don't even do a painting, but just a color chart of how many variety of subtle greens you can make with just ultramarine blue, cad yellow light and white. And um, well, you can throw in the red also once in a while to uh, mute it. But you can come up with so many different colors of green with just those three colors. Again, the red being the complement to mute it. You can come up with every color that you can buy in a tube. Now, it won't be as strong as a tubed green, but I think that's an advantage because we buy those tubed colors and they're so intense and they they don't harmonize with your palette. Now, you can make it harmonize, but to me, that's, that's just complicating it more. Now, I probably will try and use a bit more viridian as a variety of green, but most of my green mixtures will be with the cad yellow light blue and some red. So, cause you can get such subtle variations that creates a lot of color change. Well, there's a nice, yeah, that's a good tip. I'm, I'm going to experiment more with that. I have been experimenting with that, but you know, the allure of saturated colors is, is a very hard thing to overcome. Again, that I'm just talking about a friend of mine, 
Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one thing I remember uh, Skip Whitcomb was talking about that too, and yeah. he, he made the statement. It was someone else's statement, I think, but somebody uh, earlier centuries of painting that said a beautiful landscape is one that has a good composition, good value, and a little bit of color. <laughs> and that's true. I mean, a good composition and, and good value and color harmony makes a beautiful painting. And the minute you start introducing, and this is more of a personal choice, I understand, but you start introducing really bright, intense colors everywhere, you're going to destroy that and, uh, you know, destroy the value and the color harmony. So got to be real. It makes painting real hard when you start thinking about all those tubed colors you could buy and squeeze out on the palette. Right, right. Well, I got work to do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a simplified work. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I don't know. Have you I, had a chance to look around here in the great state of Georgia to see what kind of subjects might appeal to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm about an hour from the mountains, I think. Yeah. An hour and 20 minutes or so. And I've been up there a little bit, but just right around here, there are so many little country roads that lead everywhere, go all over the place. So there's, there's a ton of stuff to paint. So I'm trying to sort through all that just close by first, and then I'm going to spread out and uh, see what there is. So, yeah, there's, there's one place I visited often with my wife, but when I travel with my wife, I don't paint because my time is focused on her but but right. i want to go to um i was just out at sweetwater creek state park the other day and it's absolutely beautiful and it's about, yeah it's about 10 miles from where i live uh the creek is just amazing and it's a beautiful place beautiful place have to, we'll, we'll have to we'll have to try it phil oh sure <laughs> i'm up for yeah. that yeah. So you are a teacher as well as a painter. Um, and that's been obvious in our conversation for the last several minutes, uh, your willingness to share information. You break it down very simply. How did you get into teaching uh, art? Well, kind of right away, which I probably shouldn't have right out of art school. I was we moved back to Missouri and I was would teach landscape painting. And while I was still trying to figure out how to paint or what painting is. But so from early on, I was teaching outdoor classes and it was a good supplement to painting sales, which weren't very good for the first 10 years. But I also realized I'm, I'm learning probably quite a bit more as I teach, because again, it keeps me more grounded and focused on what's important. So that really helped, uh, helped my, my painting was teaching. I don't know, about 2007 or eight when the economy was not great for painting sales anymore. We kind of looked around and my wife is a um, you know, computer expert. We had the idea of trying to do something online and we noticed a few people were doing it, but we set up some courses online where I would do some demonstrations and uh, people could watch them on the computer and then they could do the lessons and send me an image and I would correct them on Photoshop, which I find a, Photoshop's great. I mean, I really like messing around with it because it's so clean. It's kind of like gouache has the same effect of gouache, but you can paint over a painting and make corrections really well. I mean, it, it's a, yeah, it's a you've, good, you've got it's a multiple good layers that you can yeah. hide and show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and you can uh, bring things forward and, 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 and hide them again. And, but that was a good way to teach. And I really enjoy doing that as well as doing the physical workshops. So I do several physical workshops each year, always have one through Scottsdale Artist School in Tubac, Arizona. And I'm looking for uh, uh, maybe a, a couple here in Georgia. Oh, and a few other areas. I used to set up workshops where my kids were. My son went to seminary in Louisville. So for four years, I did workshops there, pay for our visit. But it's a good way, too, to get around the country and meet different people and um, teach different groups. I also teach one in New York. Uh, it's Central Park. It's a four-day workshop. We spend a day at the Metropolitan Museum. I bet that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's of course, museum is great. That 
uh, goes without saying. And then we spent three days painting in Central Park. Nice thing about New York is nobody cares what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> nobody sees you. you. We could all paint nude in the park and nobody would even notice us because there's so much so much going on there. Nobody cares about uh, anybody else in New York City. Uh, but I really enjoy that. And uh, my son's now a pastor in New York City. So we're, we're there uh, at least once a year. But we have the online courses as well. We have a boot camp course, which is pretty intense, that has 27 videos and lessons in it. And it's all online. Yes. Yeah, it's online. Then we have a, a light and shadow workshop, which is a little bit smaller workshop. Which I'm thinking it has 12 full length videos on it, well, again, with lessons and things like that. And uh, then we have a membership, which is called Easel Insight which is a monthly membership. I think it's $30 a month right now, but that's where you get weekly short lessons on the basics of painting, composition, value, color, brushwork, uh, and also a Facebook group, a private Facebook group that goes with it where people can post their work and, uh, then we all jump in and critique each other's work. And so they have access to you, right? Yeah. I'm on the Facebook group and I'll, make comments and, and show some suggestions to make some changes on their paintings. So, which, you know, it, it kind of creates a community and everybody gets to know each other. And the boot camp workshop, we have once a year, a free convention. Right now it's in Tucson for three days. And artists that are members of the boot camp workshop, we all meet in Tucson and we talk about paintings and I do demonstrations and we all go out and paint and stuff. So it's a... Is that a big group or is, you keep it small or... We've had, well, we had the first one last year. I think okay. It, That's great. Had, uh, 15, 20 people come out and, uh, and again, it forms that community of artists because it's hard to paint alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so to get some feedback or to see that others are struggling with the same thing. And, and then, you know, and a place to get some answers and how to proceed. I think the big thing is to know how to practice because we come back from a workshop with all these ideas, but not an idea of how to proceed. Well, how you do know, you do that? How do you practice? Well, I tell you the best way, again, to simplify yeah. the okay. idea of practice is to make things small, keep things small because you learn more on a smaller canvas board an eight by 10, six by eight, maybe nine by 12. Then you do on a 30 by 40 or 20 by 24 because you can practice all the elements or fundamentals of painting quickly and, and, and learn something from it. Bigger painting, you're spending all your time trying to fill a large canvas. So the bigger paintings are more a test to see what you've learned from the smaller paintings. But we learn by repetition so when you're trying to study an idea, and I, it helps to focus on one idea at a time. So for value paintings, doing a series of black and white paintings. So if I'm wanting to learn more about like separating the planes of a landscape, the four big basic planes of a landscape, I might set aside 15 small six by eight canvas boards and either go outside and do 15 black and whites or pick out images to do them from and spend a week or two just focusing on that. And um, then same thing on color, focus on color temperature, get a bunch of small boards and just focus on that. So you can kind of look at what your progress would be on one basic idea or fundamental of painting, as opposed to every painting being, I have to get the composition right, I have to get the value right, the color right, brushwork right. Just focus on one aspect at a time. And that's practice. So practice the right thing. Keep it simple. Right. Choose one one subject to master and then, then move on to another. Yeah. And then you can, you know, then try a 12 by 16, 16 by 20, where you try and put it all together. Right. Uh, but for practice or understand, we tend to understand things better or understand the thought process. At least I do when I focus on one area at a time. So if I'm doing value, Studying values, I'm going to do black and white value paintings where I don't have to worry about the color or do markers, uh, gray markers. I'll do a series of thumbnail drawings with gray markers with four, four values. 
and simplify it that way. So whatever helps understanding the process, I think, is the best way to practice. Well, I, I took you away from your discussion about your online education source, but <laughs> you, you captured my attention with the idea of practice. So, so I appreciate you letting me do a little yeah. squirrel chase there. Yeah, that's a big part of it, though. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> where can people find out more about your online uh, courses and training? Uh, starkstudio.com or philstarkstudio.com. Okay. I should, I should have written that down. That's all right. It's going to be in the show notes. <laughs> okay. I will have uh, a link to it. Yeah. I, starkstudio.com. Uh, you, then there's links on that page to the different workshops and, um, that you can. Yeah. You can and, and that's stark with an E. It's, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. I just, I just, that's the beauty of being able to podcast and record and I can also look on the computer as I go. <laughs> yeah. So there yeah. it is. Yeah. Phil Stark Studio. You have a wealth of information on here. I'm looking at your resource library. I mean, that's that's a free tool. And yet uh, there's a lot here. I'm looking through some of the, the e-books that you have, composition, working with color, seeing shapes instead of detail, brushwork oh. and edges. I, I'm just going down through the whole list there. Um, it's a spoiler alert. I should have given yeah. a spoiler <laughs> alert before. A lot of good information right there for free. And then you said your workshop, your online workshop. Is that the right word? Workshop? It's not. Yeah. A, yeah. Okay. That, yeah. So that's a monthly fee of, of $30, $35, or something like that. Yeah. That's the Easel Insight. Um, uh, Easel membership. Insight. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And that's a monthly membership. And then the others are the boot camp workshop. And the light and shadow workshop are what you buy and you have access to it forever. So. And, and then if people want to learn more about you as a fine art artist, they would go to Philip, not Philip, philstark.com, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That has more of my, my work on it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And it's beautiful. It's great work. Really enjoy looking at it. I'd yeah. like to see it in person. I'm going to yeah. have to do well, that. You're, you're represented sure. in, in several galleries. Uh, right now I'm in, um, uh, Settlers West Gallery in Tucson, Arizona, mm -hmm. and, uh, Bighorn Gallery in Tubac, Arizona and Cody, Wyoming. Cody, Wyoming. Okay, great. Yeah. So do you, do you do mostly sales through, uh, the galleries or do you also do online sales or, or sell oh, through I, the workshops? Yeah, I, I do some online sales. We're in, uh, several museum shows a year. Yeah. Okay. Um, and between that and the galleries, that takes up, you know, most of the, it used to, you know, be in five or six galleries, but it's just hard to get all that, all those galleries filled and happy. So <laughs> we're finding it easier with just a few, although I am looking around uh, uh, East Coast or Southeast Coast now for a gallery or two. So, Well, Phil, it's been a pleasure speaking with you on The Artful Painter. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Now that Phil Stark lives in my neck of the woods, I look forward to meeting him soon and perhaps painting with him. Please be sure to check out his fine art website. There you will see his gallery of paintings that are just filled with light. They're quite beautiful. So you'll want to check that out. Also check out his learning resources websites. I have links in the show notes for this episode so you can find it easily. On those uh, learning resources website, he has both free as well as affordable premium learning tools available to help you grow as an artist. Before I close out this episode, I have a favor to ask. As you probably have discerned from listening to previous episodes, I've let it slip out that I was at one time a web developer and software developer. So I'm naturally curious about the challenges that you face as an artist in, in having a website. So I'd like, I'd like for you to go to carlolson.tv slash contact. There's a form there. Fill it out. Send me an email through that form. And let me know, do you have a website? If you have a website, where are you hosting it? Are you using something like FASO, Art Storefronts, Wix, Weebly, Squarespace, WordPress, or some other platform that I may not be aware of? Do you sell your art or other art products through your website? What's your biggest challenge in maintaining your web presence? Are you getting the traffic that you were hoping for? 
If there was one thing that would make your online presence easier, what would that be? So that's, I know that's a mouthful, but I'm really interested in what you're doing uh, to present your artwork online. Again, you could drop me a note through my website at carlolson.tv. Just click the contact tab and fill out the form there. Thank you for listening to The Artful Painter. I'll see you in the next episode.